Uh, should uh, Muslims uh, take a lesson from the West uh, in regards to their protests? Point. I think Bloom is chasing phantoms and ghosts. Absolutely not. I don't think even the West should take lessons from the West. We're chasing ghosts. In America, in his own country, every 13 seconds a woman is battered. In the UK, there's 160 rapes a day, that's about 90,000 a year, and that's not me saying it, that's not a mad mufti or mullah, it's actually Amnesty International UK. If you look at NSPCC research, 7% of all children are victims of child abuse. Let's not chase phantoms, let's not chase ghosts. There's 4,000 children under the age of 14 that hang themselves in their own bedrooms in this country, in the UK. I mean, come on, let's, let's get a grip here, let's not be opportunistic and political rhetoric. Let's discuss values and, and what kind of values are going to solve the problems that we need to deal with. And in response to one of the guests in London, I like to say, look, you know, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon, upon him, he never blamed other people for his situation. He wasn't, didn't have this victimhood mentality. What we need to do as Muslims is actually take the stand and follow the Quranic value of ud'u ila sabili rabbika, call those to the way of your Lord. And we took do this by da'wah. Da'wah essentially meaning calling people to our heritage, our way of life. And it's from this da'wah, this communication, we can have positive engagement with the wider society. This is what Muslims need to do. Fine, the media are at fault. If we read the works of Elizabeth Paul and Van Dyke, we know the media create the framework of discourse that allows things to be okay. For example, if the framework of discourse shifts according to the media that Muslims are terrorists, then people are going to start thinking this is an okay concept to have or an okay concept to discuss. So there is a problem with the media. However, what can we do? How can we stand in an emotional space where we could create the new realm of possibility so Muslims can actually actively engage all around the world? And I suggest and I ask all Muslims specifically to engage with the tradition and teach people what we're about. American people just don't know nothing about Islam. They're ignorant. It's because the government keeps them ignorant, the media keeps them ignorant. It's now we take the opportunity to empower ourselves and say, look, I want to express my Islam wherever I am. What are your thoughts, sir? Well, with regards to religious tolerance, it is well known that in Islamic history when Quranic values and Islamic values were implemented uh, during history, we saw some very positive things to the point where if we look at some academic works, we see that actually Christians used to ask Muslims to rule over the Christians. Uh, even the Jews, uh, a very famous Jewish historian, a contemporary Jewish historian, Zayn Zohar, he said thus when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar in the Iberian Peninsula, the Jews saw the Muslims as liberators from Christian persecution. We even had in the 15th and 16th century rabbis, for example, David de Bertinoro, who traveled to Baghdad and said exactly the same things. We have Einar Gratz, another Jewish historian, a 19th century Jewish historian, saying that the Muslims the, treated the Jews very kindly and very well. We have letters in Philip Mansell's book called Constantinople. In 1453, a rabbi writes a letter to the persecuted brethren in Europe saying, come to the land of the Turks, come to the land of the Muslims. And this is not just an accidental historical product. This is because of its Islam because there's a mutawatir hadith which is a, a narration of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that is the same value in terms of authenticity than the Quran and it says whoever harms a non-Muslim living under our protection harms the Prophet himself so this is the beauty of the Islamic values and we saw this in history is that is that true what Mr. Bloom says do you agree with uh, his statements essentially I disagree with his statements it's well known if you look at various academic literature the impact on the Zionist lobby with regards to American politics. I mean, to even claim something antithetical to this would probably mean that Bloom is probably living on another planet. But I would like to add that this whole situation, especially with, the, with regards to freedom of speech, we must understand Western tradition and Eastern tradition. And I think they, they, they meet at some point because Western tradition, if we read the works of John Stuart Mill, Thomas Paine and others, they always said that if you're going to express yourself in an environment, in a public environment, it has to be pegged on the framework of morality, of, of, of moral norms. Now these neoliberals, what they do, they try to clutch at intellectual straws and they want to run away with you know, certain statements and say, no, we should express ourselves in any way possible. But we all know freedom of expression or expression in a particular society is pegged on law and values. And the discussion should be what law and what values must be following. And if you look at, for example, the duplicit behavior and the hypocrisy coming from the Obama administration and Western media, when they were saying, yeah, you know, it's not good to burn the Quran, it's insensitive, but you know what? 
You know what? It's still freedom of speech. This is a joke. What if the Muslims started to burn the Bible, which we believe is a haram, it's a forbidden thing to do anyway? What if Muslims started to do things like, you know, go crazy about the cartoons? We saw the fury that happened, a hundred people died, embassies were burnt, and the focus was on the Muslims. And there's a dis duplicit behavior when it comes on the one hand, when certain people in the West are doing things in the name of freedom of speech, but when it comes to the Muslims, oh, they're so wrong, they're so bad. So what we have to do is really understand the East and the Western tradition and see where they meet so we can have a positive discussion with regards to what's happening just one second there. I like I like to give time to my London expert to respond to you well essentially what we have to realize is that Muslims are not that sensitive we don't really have a problem with discussion dialogue and debate what we have a problem is how we couch that debate and that discussion historically for example if we look into Baghdad what we saw in Baghdad historically we saw atheists deists Muslims Christians and Lots of people from different theological and political and philosophical points of the spectrum coming together and having a frank, open discussion. The Quran, which is the book of the Muslims, tells us to debate in ways that are good uh, and, and to talk in, with good speech. So there's an importance here and there's an, there's an element of focusing on having good debate and dialogue. But good debate and dialogue is not actually you know, using the media opportunistically, it's not burning the Quran. You know, this reminds us of the days in Toledo when they used to burn the Talmud for God's sake. You know, this is not civilization. This is why I like to come back on my point of freedom of speech or expression is actually pegged in society's values and law. For example, in Britain, we have libel laws, we have hate speech laws, and the list goes on and on and on. The point I like to make is, what are the values and what is the law expression should be pegged on? I would argue that these values and these expressions should be pegged on the Islamic view on law and the Islamic view on morality, because it not only has shown that differences can come together on a platform and have frank discussion, but it has also shown that expression Expression is not just for the sake of expression, it's neoliberal view. Actually, what expression does is for acquiring truth, accountability, and, and, and justice.